Now, as the number of uh, coronavirus disease cases have skyrocketed, the race to attain the vaccine approval is on. More than 100 candidate vaccines are being developed and tested to prevent infection. And now many vaccine candidates are even undergoing the human uh, stage 2 and stage 3 trials to prove their efficacy and safety, while some countries like Russia and China have already even approved uh, vaccines. Well, to talk more about the vaccine race, we're joined by Dr. Paul Offit, an American uh, pediatrician who specializes in infectious disease vaccines, immunology. He's also the co-inventor of a rotavirus uh, vaccine. Thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, on the show today, uh, Dr. Offit. First and foremost, everyone is hoping for news on a coronavirus vaccine soon. There's so many different candidates that are being worked on. There's also worry in the minds of people regarding it, especially when, you know, there's all this talk and hype about how there's a race for a vaccine. What would you say about this? Right. Well, typically it takes about 15 to 20 years to develop a vaccine. But the difference now is, one, there are, there are more than 100 companies across the globe who are working on it. And two, what the government and the World Health Organization has done is they've taken the risk out of it for companies. The government has said, we'll pay for phase three trials, meaning large prospective placebo controlled trials. We'll pay for mass production, even though we don't know whether these vaccines work or are safe yet. No company would ever do that. So the, the government's taken the risk out of it. As long as we do phase three trials, big phase three trials, then I think the, the public can feel confident that we at least have proven that a vaccine is to some extent safe and to some extent effective. Now, the Russia vaccine uh, announcement that created quite a sensation, but this vaccine hasn't gone through this phase three trial, has it? That's correct. That, that trial hasn't started yet. That, that vaccine is really two vaccines in one. Uh, Vladimir Putin announced that, uh, that they were the first country to approve a vaccine, but in fact, they're actually behind many other uh, uh, countries in the development of a vaccine because they haven't even started to do a phase three trial yet. And doctor, do you think that there needs to be a big effort uh, to uh, build the public's confidence in a vaccine? Uh, it's not so much of a challenge maybe here in India, more so in the United States. Also, it will be the first time that so many adults will have to be vaccinated. Right. I, th I think we'll be able to explain this vaccine uh, or these vaccines to the public as soon as we know more about them. I mean, right now, the uh, COVID-19 vaccine is theoretical. I think once we have data and can show, for example, that a vaccine is, let's say, 75% effective at pre preventing severe disease, at, and that it's been given to 20,000 people safely, um, and if the virus is still doing what it's doing, which is in the United States killing 1,000 people a day, I think that, that, that once that's explained and the characteristics of the vaccine are explained, then I think we can convince people that, it's, uh, that the benefits of the vaccine clearly outweigh any theoretical risks. And are you hopeful of, of a knockout medicine soon for coronavirus? You know, we have uh, medicines like remdesivir that bring down the duration of the illness and steroids like dexamethasone that are being used currently. Um, no, I think I think the um, our best chance lies in preventing this disease, not treating it. Um, remdesivir, you know, shortened the length of illness by about four days, and that was valuable. Dexamethasone is of value in people who are severely ill. I think that monoclonal antibodies directed against the virus uh, would be excellent at preventing uh, this disease. But that said, I do think it's not an easy way to go, and the better way to go ultimately is with a successful vaccine. Also, we're seeing reports on different strains of the virus and how one strain is more virulent than the other. Right. So, so this is a so-called single-stranded RNA virus. So like all single-stranded RNA virus, it mutates. The question is, does it mutate in a functionally important way? So, for example, influenza also is a single-stranded RNA virus that mutates, but it mutates so much from one year to the next that you need to, that natural infection or immunization the previous year doesn't protect you. So you need a yearly vaccine. There's no evidence that this, va that this virus is mutating away from the vaccine. And so then the question becomes, are the mutations making this virus more or less virulent? I don't think there are any solid data for that yet, although there are pretty solid data that a mutation has increased the virus's contagiousness. So I guess we'll wait to see whether or not this the, uh, the virulence data pans out. But for right now, I think that's preliminary. And what about reinfections after recovering from COVID? Uh, that's also something everybody's wondering about how long the antibodies last. Well, that's the most important question. I mean, the question is, does natural infection protect against uh, challenges associated with reinfection? In other words, are there people out there who get moderate to severely ill, recover, and then get moderate to severely ill again when they, they encounter this virus again? If that's true, that would be bad news. But, but we haven't really heard that yet. I mean, there are those diseases where natural infection doesn't protect against reinfection, like strep throats, for example, which you can get again and again, or gonorrhea, which you can get again and again. That's why we don't have uh, vaccines against those diseases. 
diseases. But for, for now, the virus has only been out there about eight or nine months. So don't, we don't have a lot of information on this. But I'm optimistic, based on what we know about human coronaviruses, that natural infection will offer some level of protection for some length of time. I think there's every reason to believe that's true. And, uh, you know, would this mean that we'd need a vaccine every year if it's proven that you can get reinfected? Um, if that's the case, if this virus is like influenza, where it mutates so much from one year to the next that you need uh, a, a, a vaccination every year, then then sure, we'd have to deal with that. But I, I don't, all the early indications are that that's not true. I think human coronaviruses don't do what influenza does. So I don't suspect this virus is going to do what influenza does. Hopefully this virus, this, this SARS-CoV-2, will be a single serotype virus as SARS-1 was, as MERS was. So I think we'll, we'll see. Now, there are also a huge number of asymptomatic people, and that's been one of the challenges in tracking the disease here in India. We're seeing it spread, you know, from cities to smaller towns and even rural areas, and many of those spreading it are asymptomatic. Yeah, well, it's certainly true that that um, we vastly underestimate the number of cases. I mean, most people are, are many people are asymptomatic, never get tested, so you don't know that they, in fact, were 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 infected. The only the best way to know that is to do antibody studies. And when you look at antibody studies, uh, you find that the the incidence of disease is probably ten times greater than than what we thought. So in in the United States, where we estimate roughly five million cases, it's probably closer to fifty million cases. And now we're going in for a change of season. You know, it's getting colder. Is, is this going to make it all more challenging? In theory, yes. Uh, you know, this virus is unusual, though. Usually viruses like this, which are envelope viruses, don't do very well in, in high temperatures. And viruses that spread by small droplets, respiratory droplets, also don't do well in, in humid climates. Yet this virus seems to rage during summer months. It's raging in hot and humid climates like Florida or Texas. Um, and so that's never would have been predicted. So, so I'm not sure exactly how to characterize this yet. It's been a loose, an elusive, difficult to characterize virus. And already we've had a number of surprises um, just in the first eight or nine months. All right. Uh, also, uh, what are your views on the human challenge trials? This is, uh, you know, of course, you know, but for our viewers, where healthy people in the vaccine trials are actually exposed to the coronavirus, they actually volunteer for it. Do you think this would help in uh, speeding up the vaccine development? There's so much natural infection out there that I really don't think you have to do human challenge trials. Also, human challenge trials don't exactly mimic the human situation, you know, because when you're out there in, in the real world, you're exposed to different quantities of virus. Sometimes you're exposed to a large quantity of virus, which may more likely to make you uh, sicker and as compared to a smaller quantity of virus. That's not going to be mimicked in challenge trials. Also, you're not going to ever give, I think, a human challenge trial to someone who's over 60 years of age. There is no rescue drug for this virus. So, so there Therefore, you wouldn't be able to know about that population, and you de do need to know about that population before you would uh, would give uh, vaccine, you know, routinely uh, to to to, the, to your population. All right, and then finally, uh, I know a slightly unfair question, but uh, what is your estimate now on uh, since we've been, you know, eight nine months into this pandemic? What is your estimate on when this will end? Um, it's really hard to make that estimate. I mean, if, if you had a vaccine was, that was, say, like 75 percent effective, given the contagiousness of this virus, then you would expect you would have to immunize about two thirds of the population. But that, that would also mean it would have to be effective against shedding, um, not just protection against moderate to severe disease, but shedding associated with asymptomatic infection or mildly symptomatic infection. And um, I think um, that you're probably still going to see shedding in some people who are vaccinated. So it's, it's hard to know exactly. But um, I think it's probably going to take us a couple of years to three years to get on top of this.